Hi, this is Roger from Kanker Labs and today I'm going to demonstrate to you how we select the tubes or valves that we supply with our tube experimental kit uh, RT100, which if you don't already know it, looks like uh, this. I hope it gets in focus after a few seconds. And uh, we see we use the base unit of the RT100 itself to select the valves with a special method and uh, that is necessary uh, for uh, the usage of 12 volts anode voltages uh, because the valves were originally not uh, designed to work uh, with 12 volts and so not every tube uh, that we get is really uh, useful with the RT100 but uh, if you are bu a buyer of the kit you can be 100% sure that you get selected tubes uh, so that all the experiments are also uh, working. And well, now let's take a look at the method and uh, how it's done. So just a short video about uh, how we select the tubes here at Kanker Labs uh, with the method we call the starting current method. I'm not sure if this is the correct translation of the German word Anlaufstrom. Perhaps you know better and leave us a note about the uh, right translation. Anyway, how does it work? Well, let's suppose we take a tube, first of all, with its heater and um, most tubes nowadays are so-called indirectly heated, which means uh, the uh, heater filament itself is not the cathode, but it's only, as the name suggests, a heater. And um, the heat of the heater then heats up the cathode, and the cathode uh, consists of a material which em emits electrons uh, even at relatively low temperatures. When you use metals, as in directly uh, heated uh, tubes, then uh, you might need thousands of degrees Celsius uh, to get enough electrons to emit from, from the metal wire. But if you use um, special uh, oxides like barium oxide or similar, then you can emit enough electrons um, even at temperatures of a few hundred degrees Celsius. Now, above the, I'm not very good at drawing, above the cathode, there's a cloud of electrons, which gets, of course, thinner the further away we get from the cathode. And now somewhere here in this region we'll have the grid, one or more, depending if it's a uh, tri triode or if it's a pentode. And somewhat further above there's the plate or anode. And now let's suppose we connect the anode with the grid, then there will, uh, by pure uh, physics, there will be a current flowing from the cathode through this cloud of electrons to the connected grid and anode. And that's what is uh, the starting current. So there is no voltage on the anode. We simply measure the current with, an, with a current meter here from, from the cathode to the connected grid or grids depending on type of tube and the anode. So uh, quite a simple method. And what's important about this is um, in our low voltage experiments where we use anode voltages of uh, only 12 volts, uh, it's really uh, necessary that there are enough electrons already emitted by the cathodes because we not only have 
uh, low anode voltages, we also have low grid voltages. And uh, to have enough electrons uh, being able to fly from the cathode uh, to the anode by only this 12 volt potential difference, because the cathode we suppose is at zero volts, um, uh, it's, it's quite important uh, to have enough emissivity of, of the cathode. And you will see in a minute that there are substantial differences between uh, tubes even out of the same production charge. Um, how large the starting current we can measure here becomes. So let's take a look at uh, our test setup and make some measurements. So this is our test setup for selecting the tubes for our tube experimental kits. And as you see, I don't use a uh, uh, usual power supply, but instead uh, simply a six volt lead acid battery. Um, I'm using a combined digital and analog multimeter in uh, milliamps uh, mode, DC, uh, DC current. And well, uh, it's pre-wired, uh, the, the tube sockets are pre-wired just for testing so that uh, the anodes of all tubes are connected together with uh, the grids. And uh, uh, one pin is, uh, that I measure is simply the cathode and the other pin where I measure the current is the uh, connected grids and anode. And now let's take a 6J2 from, uh, from one bin. Let's insert it. Of course, we have to wait until the tube heats up, which takes uh, around uh, half a minute. And But we'll see already that the current is rising now. Uh, the numbers that you can read are behind the decimal point are now microamps. And we see that this tube uh, stabilizes around 24 microamps. Now let's take another one from another bin. It was the same production charge. Um, and now let's see what the starting current of this tube will finally arrive at. You already can see that it gets um, quite uh, higher than uh, the previous tube. It settles around, uh, around 90 microamps, 84, 85. And now let's take a tube from a third bin and you will be surprised how high the starting current here gets after the heater has heated up the cathode. Now this tube apparently gives us a starting current around above 400 microamps getting near to 500 microamps. So there's quite a substantial uh, difference between uh, the tubes. And uh, well, we select the tubes that way that in the tube experimental kits, uh, those tubes with the highest starting current and with, with uh, as nearly e equal starting currents as possible uh, are bent together. So that was it for today for a short demo, uh, how we select the tubes here for our uh, tube kit RT100. And in a forthcoming part of the series, I'll show you how the same tubes uh, measure with our electronic curve tracer that we use. And uh, well, you can be looking forward uh, because it's quite interesting to see the curves uh, on a uh, computer screen uh, building up one after another. So that was it to, for today. Uh, I hope you liked it. If, if you did like it, uh, then please give it a big thumbs up. 
Uh, any further questions uh, you can use, uh, you can put in our forum or of course any comments down in the YouTube comments down below. Okay, until next time, bye from Kanker Labs.